Okay, so um, last night we spoke a little bit about the prelude to the weekend glorification of Sri Ram and how the uh, great text of Sri Ramayana actually manifested by the grace of Sri Narada Muni coming through his great devotee uh, Valmiki Muni. So this morning, continuing with the theme of our class or our presentations, we're going to try to illustrate some of the more important messages of Mara, uh, Ram Ramayan in relationship to the different pastimes in Ramayan. And tomorrow, this morning I'll focus on a very sweet and loving pastime which is deep and full of uh, strong emotional outpourings and that is the love between Ram and Bart, his brother. And what led up to that emotional outpouring? So, because of a little bit of a time constraint, I'm going to uh, forego Jai Radha Madhava, but we'll just do uh, Mangala Charana. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Statitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bande Hum Shigaro Shigata Padekamalam Shigarun Vaishnavam Scha Si Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Visha Kam Vitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinavandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Swari Prikabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pehebhacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare hmm. Tomorrow, for tomorrow's class, which is a two-hour class in the morning, we'll speak about how the whole Ramayana unfolds from the appearance of Ram to his exile in the forest. But today I wanted to focus on one of the principal pastimes which is quite deep and is the foundation for how the whole Ramayana played itself out. And that is when Mantara, she was a uh, maidservant of one of the queens of Ram, uh, I'm sorry, Dasara. Dasara had 353 wives. <laughs> Haribo. <laughs> Sometimes people say, I have problem with one. Yes, he had 353. He had three principal wives, Koshalya, Kaikei, and uh, Sumitra. The other 350 were incidental. During that time, Parasaram was roaming the countryside uh, looking for Kshatriya kings to destroy. And so, but he made one agreement that if any Kshatriya is getting married, I won't attack him. So every time Parasaram came into the area, Dasarat decided to get married. So that's why he had 300 more wives, 350 more wives. So they say the you know, the wife is the protection of the husband. In this case, it's foundational. 
So this was um, the reason why he had so many wives. But out of the three, Koshaya, Kaikei, and Sumicha, Kaikei was the favorite wife. And she was the youngest of the three. And she helped him many times in battle, so much so that he gave her a boon that any time anything she wanted, she could ask for. She said, not now. I'll take it in due course of time. And so Mantara, when she learned that Ram was, she didn't like Ram for some reason. Everyone loved Ram except Mantara. Ram was lovable by everyone. Just by seeing Ram, people would fall in love with him. He was so beautiful and so, his presence was so, so absorbing, so attractive. People would go into states of happiness immediately, ecstasy, just simply by seeing his beautiful countenance. But Mantara, she, she was a different personality. And she was old, invalidic, and uh, she didn't want Ram to go onto the throne because she was thinking, Kaikei, Ram is the uh, actual, he's the, uh, he is the son of Koshaya, which is the principal queen, and I am the servant of Kaikei. So Kaikei will now be relegated to a lesser position. What will be my, you know, destiny? So she connived to use her, uh, intelligence, we might say, misuse of intelligence, to try to poison Kaikei. Okay, Kai, Kaikei loved Asarath, a very obedient wife, but Mantara spoke in such a way that she changed the whole mind of Kaikei. And she was basically saying that actually, you know, Ram, he's gonna be coordinated tomorrow, and he is the, the son of Koshalya. Once he becomes coronated, Dasanath will make Koshalya the principal queen and you'll be relegated to a lesser position. And you will be neglected. He won't even talk to you anymore. He comes to see you every day. And now you'll be in a, you'll be in a marginal position at best. So therefore, don't you remember? Don't you remember? the boons that he gave you, or the opportunities to get boons, now is the time. Kaikei didn't, wasn't inclined towards what she was saying, but she spoke in such a way that it was so convincing and so full of what we say, uh, ways to make Kaikei's attention turn away from her feelings towards Ram. And she said, actually, your, your son, Bart, he is more qualified to rule the throne. But because Ram is the oldest son, he is getting the opportunity. But we know that your son, Bart, he should actually be the, the king. So therefore, you should use one of those boons to request Dasara to make Bart the king instead of Ram. And we know that when Ram hears that he will not be the king, he will become angry. He will gather his armies and attack Bart, and there will be much, much devastation. So therefore, in order to avoid that, you should, have the, uh, you should use your other boon and have Ram go to the forest for 14 years. After hearing Kaikegi for a long period of time, she became somewhat changed in mind. This is the power of, of association. Sometimes they ask, people ask, tell me who do you associate with and I'll tell you all about yourself. How powerful is association? That's why it says Saru Sangha, Saru Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoi, Lava Matta, Saru Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. That one moment's association with a great soul and one can become purified and reach, reach self-realization simply by that association. So we know and we see how when one is in a different type of association, one starts to pick up certain characteristics and qualities of that association. And if one is not fixed in their own, we say, values, 
and activities, one can be easily changed by negativity unknowingly. Lord Chaitanya brought that out many times with many of his examples with his devotees and chastised them from the wrong association. So association is very powerful. That's why Srila Prabhupada used to say, there are three most important things in our activities of devotional service. So he said association, association, association. So if you got those three, you can write them down. <laughs> Why well, he may have wanted to make the point because in association we become inspired in our devotional life. In association with devotees, we practice chanting, hearing the glories of the Lord. We also get purified from our anarthas in the association of devotees. There's so many benefits to association with devotees. That's why we hold these retreats. It's just simply, it's all about sadhu sangha. It's all about sadhu sangha. Bringing together the devotees in such a way that they can develop friendships and loving relationships and glorify the Lord in that association. And that is the essence of spiritual life. We read and we hear in the spiritual world that's what goes on. Devotees come together simply to glorify Krishna, to serve Krishna in different ways. And they love Krishna and they develop love for each other. So the power of association is actually the foundation for our, our happiness and our advancement in spiritual life. Sometimes people think I should avoid that association. But that is simply the speaking of the, the material energy. Material energy somehow or other convinces one that, you know, devotee association is really too difficult. You have to be something you're not. And you never know. You know, you're put together with a lot of people who you don't even know. And, you know, how can you be yourself? And, you know, it's in, in Maya's, you know, you hear, you just that little squeaky voice inside. And, but actually, with a, a tiny bit of humility, it takes that much. A tiny bit of humility, you can associate with any devotee if you have a little bit of humility. Not even a lot, because that's all it takes, just a little humble nature. And we can benefit so nicely from the association of devotees. Because devotees are wonderful. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you think we're... When you associate with the non-devotees, you somehow get that experience. After coming away from that association, you think, oh, yeah, now I understand, just by comparison. So, and this is why we have this weekend program, just to create more and more sadhu sangha with devotees. So, I know this is not part of the lesson, but I was just wanted to inject that Maybe if you don't know everybody, I'm sorry we don't know everybody because some people are coming from all different parts of the world. Take time and make some new friends. <laughs> Just go up and say, my name is Dasi <laughs> or Das. <laughs> and uh, who are you? Nice to meet you, Hare Krishna. <laughs> and then go from there. So it's nice. Try to make friends with some new devotees this time. And then you'll find that it devotees just love to associate with other devotees. So Kaikeyi now is changed, and she's convinced. She calls Dasarat. She tells him about these, you know, these promises that he gave her, and now he tell, he's devastated. He's beside himself. He can't believe she's saying this. He understands that her love for Ram is just as good as anyone else. And what happened? But she's, she doesn't say anything about Mantara. She simply says, I understand everything now. Actually, my son Bart should be the king. And Ram, he will become envious, and then there will be problems. So he should go to the forest for 14 years. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And now... Ram receives the news from his father. He hears that his father has requested him to go to the forest, although his father is reluctant to give these messages to his son. Why? Because he loves his son more than he loves anyone. And everyone in, this, in Ayodhya 
Iodia was hundreds and thousands of different citizens, and they all were waiting for this great coronation day. And now everything has changed. But Ram understood one thing. The first guru is the parent. The second guru is the spiritual master. The first guru is the ones you grow up with, your mother and father. They guide you. They teach you. They push you along the path. And then gradually, like qualified parents, they lead you to your spiritual, your eternal spiritual master. So we have, so Ram honoring the words of his father, not, quali not saying anything. My dear father, if this is what you require, then I am practically gone already. And then, of course, Ram left along with Sita and Lakshman, and then he went to the forest. What happens? Now, Bart comes back. He's away. He was, at, he was away on a mission. Now he comes back, and he hears what happens. That he is now going to be the king. His dear brother, who he loves more than himself, is now in the forest, living like a hermit amongst jungle people and animals. He's meant to live in royal palaces with royal opulences and rule the kingdom. And now he's living like a, a vagabond. I, he, he can't believe it. And when he hears he's going to be king, he knows it's not true. He doesn't want to be king. He, f he approaches his mother. He says, what is this? He becomes very angry at her and starts to chastise her. She breaks down and starts crying. Finally, he realizes this was all a plot by Mantara to somehow or other poison his mother in such a way that she would say something completely different than what her heart was. Again, the power of association. So, now one thing about Bart, he was not offended by the fact that he was being accused because when he came back, the citizens were thinking, oh, it is because of Bart that Ram has gone to the forest. Therefore, he is the culprit. He is the person who caused all the problems. Although he was blamed for that, he didn't take offense. What he was more concerned was why this whole thing happened. So now, his, his dear brother's in the forest, his father, Dasarat, when he, you know, when his son left for the forest, he couldn't live anymore. He gave up his life. He hears his, fa his father has gone. He's, he's no longer living. His brother is in the forest. And his mother has, c has created this whole thing. Now he's besides himself. So he decides to rectify the whole thing. He comes before all the citizens and explains the whole thing. And he says, now... We want to go to the forest and bring Ram back. Ram is the actual king. I had nothing to do with this. I don't want to rule the kingdom, nor do I feel qualified to rule the kingdom. He is the actual king. So all the citizens, the chief minister, Sumantra, the head priest, Vashishta, and all the citizens, they all line up with their armies. They're going to find Ram in the forest. Ram's been gone for a few months now. And so now I get to the story. <laughs> this rest of, that was all a prelude to what I wanted to say. <laughs> so now Ram's there, Sita's there, and Lakshman is there. And Ram has met, you know, a few tribal people. And he came to Bhartaraj Muni's ashram. He also met Gu Guha. And gradually, gradually, he goes to Chitrakoot Mountain. And he's staying there. And now, when all of a sudden, there is the sound of this great tumultuous, and it's pervading everywhere. Lakshman, he climbs up high on the mountain. Chitrakoot Mountain is high, and he sees this gigantic army. 
and he sees the chariot of Bart leading the army. And he's thinking, oh, he's not happy with ruling the kingdom. Now he wants to come and kill Ram so, he can, so his, uh, his reign will not be interfered with. So Lakshman has a tendency to uh, overreact. <laughs> he's a little bit, I don't know what the word is. He loves Ram so much, but he jumps to conclusions. <laughs> It's based on his love for Ram. So he starts to say, yeah, my dear brother, here comes Ram with all his, ar uh, Bar with all his armies, and now he's going to try to attack us and, and finish us off. Just wait to see what I do. I will bathe this old earth in a gigantic river of blood where the ghosts will be coming and dancing in ecstasy. I mean, he's really quite, you know, uh, what we say, uh, clear on what he wants to do. And he's really, he's getting his bow, and Ram says, Ram, Lakshman, Bart loves me more than, he, 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 than anything. I'm sure this is not his intention. I think you are, you're acting a little bit beyond what you, and then finally, after preaching to his brother, Lakshman says, how come I'm like that? Why am I like that? And, and Bart said, and Ram says, it's because you love me. <laughs> so he makes him feel good. <laughs> he doesn't chastise him. And so now the armies stop at the base of Chitrakoot Mountain. And Bart wants to go up the mountain alone. His mission is to somehow convince Ram to come back and take the kingdom. This is interesting. Now, when the parents and the families who are quite wealthy leave the world, they leave what is called the inheritance. So Dasarat, he left, and so there are many sons. There was Bart, there was Lakshman, there was Ram, there was Sutrugna. Sutrugna and Bart were close friends. Ram and Lakshman were very dear to each other. So they paired off with their loving relationships among the family. Now it's interesting, you can think about this, when a wealthy person, imagine, you know, there's so many sisters in the family or brothers in the family, the parent dies and there's a good fortune, what do they do? A lot of times they fight over it. It should be mine, it's mine, I was the favorite one. Actually, I'm the older one. I should get it. Actually, even though you're the older one, still, you know, you don't follow your mother like I did, your father like I did. So, you know, the, the fight of inheritance, property, it goes on all the time. People come up to me and say, this is what I'm going through. I say, ha huh, what can I do? You know, Chianari <laughs> Krishna. This is the way family things are, you know. Everyone waits for the parents to die. Not all the time, but sometimes. <laughs> and they think, oh, you know, well, I love you, but, you know, I love that other thing you have, too. You know? <laughs> it's called wealth. <laughs> Money. Money's the honey, but there's also a lot of bees around honeys. So, and so, yeah. So, but this is something completely the opposite. Both persons, Ram, he's, he was destined to rule the kingdom. And he could have just told his father that actually, you know, you know, the citizens want me. What you're saying, father, is very nice, but actually I'm destined to rule. So I can't accept your, your request. He could have refused, and his father would have been happy. <laughs> But because his father was so dedicated to promises, this is the nature of a kshatriya. A kshatriya is one who makes a promise and they, they give up their life before they give up their promise. Do you know people like that? Well, I promise I'll come to the disciples' meeting. Oops. I just realized I haven't seen that movie in town. I can't make it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm just using some, some little. 
examples. But the idea is that, you know, when we promise something, it's like unless there's an actual unavoidable emergency, then that keeps good relationships. There's nothing more than when you break your promise to a person. It feels like, you know, especially if someone is close to you and they promise to do something or promise to be there with you or something, and then circumstances somehow or other dictate differently. I see it all the time. Just like, how? I guess, don't raise your hand, but just think, how many of you just before this disciples meeting got challenged with another option? Yeah, there's so many, yeah, there's, you can raise your hand. How many of you actually got challenged with another option that, oh no, <laughs> what am I gonna do? Why is like, the, yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Maya. Maya tests you. She says, oh, you're going to the disciples meeting, you're gonna make a lot of advancement, you're gonna have a good time, but actually, it's not like that. <laughs> this is more important. Don't you realize that? And it happens all the time. Why? Because Maya's job is just to increase your enthusiasm for Krishna. By giving you obstacles. Obstacles are opportunities to take greater shelter of Krishna. And when we take sh greater shelter of Krishna, we see how Krishna actually make, arranges it in such a way that we're so thankful we took Chris shelter of Krishna. Because we know Maya is always there to somehow or other create this idea that Krishna consciousness is not so important. There's so many other things in our life. Mm. And so this battle between siblings for inheritance, but it wasn't like that. Bar is only going there simply to con try to convince Ram to come back and accept the kingdom. He climbs up the mountain alone. Ram, Sita, and Lakshman, they're sitting in a fire sacrifice. Then Bart expresses his mood and approaches and let's see. And Satrugna also followed Bart up there. When Bart saw Ram, Ram broke from the fire sacrifice, got up and embraced his brother in such loving way. Then he begins to question him. And he starts to talk about the importance of leadership, how one should rule the world. He's not talking about anything else. Already, Bart is disarmed. <laughs> Ram is already understanding why Bart has come. And he's preaching to him about how important it is to rule now that he has the kingdom. Then the conversation turns to, he said, I saw the elephant, the royal elephant, but I didn't see father sitting on the elephant. Where is father? Ram doesn't know. He didn't know his father departed from the world. Bar is f so emotional, he can't speak. Then he, he understood his father is no more. Ram, he's the supreme personality of Godhead, but still, when he hears that his dear father, who he loved so much, is no longer in the world, he breaks down and, show, and sheds tears. They all decide now Ram goes to the Mandakini River and offers oblations and performs the sacrifice for the departed souls. Then Ram starts to speak. Time and destiny are two features that work together. One receives their destiny in due course of time. Bart is equipped with so much knowledge. He's going to try to convince Ram to come back. He says, you are actually meant to rule the world. You are qualified. Please come back. Ram says, how can I do that? Our father has given us the word. 
he is no longer on the planet. If I go back there, I will not be honoring his word. And he will suffer. He will suffer the reactions. Therefore, I cannot do that. Therefore, we, we don't want to f have our father suffer uh, uh, an ill destiny. I have to honor his words. No one can change destiny. Destiny is, is like, what is destiny? Destiny is actually the hands of the Lord. We call it providence sometimes. Ram understood that Kaikeyi was the person who, you know, orchestrated this whole thing. And he tells Bart, don't become angry with your mother. Actually, time and tide are actually making everything play itself out. So it is, I am destined to come to the forest, and you are destined to rule the kingdom. Bart doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> Bart, he says, actually, he says, So Bart, now he's, he says, actually, you know, there has to be one ruler and there has to be one son in the forest. So let me, I'll change places with you. You rule the kingdom and I'll stay in the forest. Ram says, I'm going to rule the forest. It is not a matter of changing places. Because one's karma and destiny cannot be exchanged for another's. One has to live out their own karma and destiny according to the laws of material nature, the laws of God. So he's speaking this philosophy, but Bart, he's thinking, I have to get Ram to come back somehow. He's determined. He's got all his arguments in line, but Ram's not budging. Why? Because he wants to honor his father's words. And Ram says, actually, to rule and to have a posi position doesn't make one a king. A king is a person who is qualified by nature and by character. It is not a matter of position. It is not a matter of, uh, what we say, having a kingdom. So he shoots down that argument that I'm going to rule, but I'm going to rule the forest. <laughs> Interesting exchange. And so you can see what, what's happening here is that the love between them are so strong, they only want the best for the other person. It's called, there's two things, tug of war and tug of love. <laughs> it, their love is trying to convince the other person to be in a better position and willing to suffer or take a lesser position for the happiness of another person. This is the principle of love. And this is being played out so nicely here. Ram says you have to forgive your mother. I know you haven't forgiven her fully yet, but she is simply an instrument in the cause of everything that happens. It is not her fault. And in order to seek forgiveness, one has to seek balance in injustice, harmony in chaos, love in hatred. He says, peace, introspection, satisfaction, and wise company are the principles of forgiveness. Peace is destroyed by, by per interpersonal desires Introspection is destroyed by ignorance. Satisfaction is destroyed by hankering after material things. I have to have this. If I don't get this, I'll be, I won't be happy. There goes your peace of mind. And wise company, good association, destroys misguidance. Misguidance comes by wrong association. Then Bart, this guy starts to s describe the duties of a Kshatriya. Bart finally relents. He said, all right, I will stay in the kingdom, but I will not rule the kingdom. You are the ruler. And then Bart unreveals Ram's shoes. He takes a pair of shoes that were Ram's that were left in the kingdom. He says, I want you to rule the kingdom. I will go in your place, but I will not rule. You are the actual ruler. 
So therefore, please step into these shoes and bless these shoes, and these shoes will rule the kingdom, not me. Ram wants to make his brother happy, so he acquiesces. He steps into the shoes, Bar takes the shoes, puts it on his head, and keeps them. Then there's one minister, his name is Jabali. You've heard of Jabali. He is a minister, and he starts to speak. He said, what is all this nonsense about destiny and karma and, and ruling and kshatriya and promises? And this is, life is meant to enjoy. Ram, you should enjoy the kingdom. It was meant for you. The, if you don't enjoy the kingdom, the citizens will not be able to enjoy you enjoying the kingdom. His whole, pro, his whole thing is about enjoyment. It, life means to enjoy. You got a chance to enjoy, and you, being the king means to enjoy. You'll have so much power, prestige, fame, honor. People will love you. They already love you. Take the position. Enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy! That's his mantra. <laughs> and Ram gets, at, gets annoyed. <laughs> Jabali, shut up! <laughs> Shoots him down right away. What is this nonsense you're speaking? And Jabali just falls on the ground flat and says, I just wanted you to come back. <laughs> Nothing else was working. I had to try something. <laughs> And then Ram kind of forgave him for his <laughs> enjoying mantras. <laughs> so now, Bart, then all these celestials appear out of nowhere. And they all come and they say, Bart, you are destined to rule, not Ram. And that's all they say and they leave. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to get into any discussions. Sometimes if you want to make a point to someone, you just say it and then don't wait for the response. <laughs> it's, sometimes it looks a little impolite, but sometimes it's very effective depending on the situation. Okay. So, then Vashishta, the head priest, he speaks from the position of guru who guides the intelligence and the authority. He says, the father gives life, the guru teaches how to live life. The father gives life, the guru teaches how to give life. And Ram says, I will follow my father, who is the original guru. So finally, of course, I left out one part where Bart decides to fast till death and then Ram stops him and says, this is why you're doing this. So then Ram, Bart, and now with the shoes, go back down the hill and talks to all the citizens. All the citizens are there. Ram comes down to meet, uh, to meet he meets his three mothers. His mothers are there, Koshalya, Sumitra, and Kaikeya are all there and he embraces all three of his mothers. He doesn't have uh, the slightest bit of uh, what we say, enmity towards his, his to Kaikei. He understood she was simply a victim of providence, that's all. Now, and then everyone, is, it's a very emotional scene at this point. Ram is not going to change. He's going to stay in the forest. He wants Bart to rule. Actually, there was another incident. When, uh, when Dasarath came to the kingdom of Kaikeya, which was ruled by a, the father of Kaikeya, Dasarath wanted to marry Kaikeya. And the king, I can't remember his name, the father of Kaikei. Dasarad said, what, please allow me to marry your daughter and when the son that she has will be the king. And then, you know, when nothing was able to convince 
But Rom revealed that nobody knew that. Nobody knew that except one person, the sister, the mutton, and he kept it quiet. He didn't want to say because everyone wanted Ram to rule the king. But Ram had promised the father of Kaikei that if she, if he gives her as his wife, her son would be the king. So when Ram said that, he said, "Actually, this is perfect. This is what father promised to your to your to to your father-in-law. To your yeah, to your to your, to your yeah." So, now, it's a very emotional scene, and then it's a loving embrace, and then Bard goes back. I mean, he's, he's crestfallen, everyone else is too, but they realize, you know, Ram's going to stay in the forest. But Bard does one thing. He decides not to stay in the kingdom. He goes to a place called Nandigram, which is nearby Ayodhya. When we were traveling in 1999, we were visiting Ayodhya. And during that time, we went to see Nandigram. It's a little village. And that village is so, it's, it's really nice. And there's a little shrine there where Bart used to stay. Bart ruled the kingdom from there. The ministers and anyone else that wanted to see him would have to go to Nandigram. And he lived like an aesthetic. He didn't wear anything royal. He never felt that he was the king. He put the shoes of Ram on the, on the throne and he ruled from there. So anyone who came for advice, he would give his advice and then ask them, go to the shoes and offer your respects. And this way, he always felt that Ram was the king, although he was given that position by default, you might say. And for 14 years, he only took barley cooked in cow urine. And his brother, Shatrugna, stayed with him during that whole time for 14 years. This was his sacrifice, just to show that actually Ram was the real king. And this, the fact that I am king is only to fulfill the desire of my father and that is only, and that is, that is to keep the promise of Ram. It's interesting, because after 14 years, something amazing happened. When the battle of Kudoshet, uh, the battle of Lanka was over, and now Ram, with the monkey soldiers headed by Sugriva and Hanuma, they're going to return. What happens is, Ram goes to Hanuman says, Hanuman, go ahead and just see, announce to Bart that Ram is coming back and just watch how he reacts. And if he hesitates even slightly, showing a little discomfort, the fact that I'm coming back, I'm not coming back. <laughs> He's not coming back. So when Hanuman went and came, Bart was so happy to see Hanuman. And they embraced, and Hanuman said, Ram, Sita, and so many others are all coming back, and Ram will rule the kingdom. Bart became ecstatic. <laughs> he just went, he was so happy. He was dancing and he f found some gift to give to Hanuman and he was just embracing Hanuman. Thank you. Because when a messenger comes and gives you good news, you love that messenger just as much as you love the person who the news is about. <laughs> right? And, and it's also the opposite sometimes too. And years ago, of course, I, don't, I heard this in stories that when some messenger would have to give bad news to a king or a leader, the messenger would get killed. <laughs> so nobody wanted that position. <laughs> and we always like to tell people good things, right? And this is another thing. To tell people something that is unpleasant, like I remember something that happened 
it was an unpleasant thing. Someone had passed away. It was somebody who was very dear to me. And Johnny Kinath Prabhu came up to me and said, I have some news. And I could understand immediately it wasn't going to be pleasant. But he said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. But, and then he left. <laughs> In other words, he allowed me to somehow or other brace myself for the unpleasant news. And then I learned it actually about two or three days later. It was the death of a dear person I knew. And so, yeah, they say you don't really have to announce bad news. It comes automatically. Good news, we like that, right? When we want to tell somebody, it's like that. Once you want to tell somebody something that, that makes them happy, you just can't wait to see that person. Sometimes you go out of your way to find that person because you know they'll become so happy just by hearing what you have to say. And you'll become happy and they'll like you even more. But that's not the reason. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just, this is a symptom of love to want to make others happy. It's a symptom of something else to make others miserable. <laughs> it's not love. And so, therefore, bad news doesn't have to be, you know, communicated. It comes automatically. So, but good news, we want to communicate that. So when Bart heard that, he was so happy. And then Hanuman came back and said, he's more happier than anybody that you're coming back. And so Ram said, very good. And then he came back. So this particular, particular pastime is, is quite sweet because it's deep in the mood of selfless love. When two people are destined practically for the same thing, and that thing is great power, opulence, wealth, and so many other material benedictions, you don't see there's some tension, some rivalry, even amongst good friends. It happens. Even amongst, you know, sometimes the best of friends become the worst of enemies. We'll, we'll speak about that when we speak a little bit about the difference between, or the relationship between Sugriva and uh, Bali. That will come up in a later lecture. So what is important here is to value relationships over possessions. You can't love things. Lo things are important because they help us in order to carry on our life. But what's most important is relationships because the whole foundation for life is relationships. And it all starts with our relationship with Krishna, with the Supreme Lord. The more we develop that relationship with the Lord, the more we develop that re our loving relationship with everyone, because everyone is connected to Krishna. And therefore, sometimes we have a, we're put into a situation to choose what we like over a situation of pleasing or making another person happy, even at the expense of giving up what we like. So sometimes it's, it becomes very diffi difficult. So relationship is actually the basis of everything. And selflessness is the nature of the soul. To be selfish is un unnatural. Why? Because we are not this body. And so anything in relationship to the body has no relationship to us. It has some value in relationship to the body. But we see that when people are, even if a person has nothing, if they have l loving relations with, other, with someone else or anyone else, they're happy. They're not, their happiness is not based on how much they are, how much they have or how much they can acquire or what position they have in life or what abilities they have. It's all about loving relationships. And it starts with Krishna and extends out to his devotees and then ultimately to all living entities. 
So, but in the material world, what is the nature of relationship? Mutual gratification. You satisfy me, and I satisfy you. What can you do for me? And if things fall apart, then the relationship falls apart like that. Why? Because everyone thinks I am this body, and things in relationship to the body are the most important thing. But the body can't love. It's the soul that loves. Sometimes people say, they use that cliche, I love you, I give you my heart, my heart is yours. But still, if somebody, if somebody was able to take their heart out and give it to you, you would say, oh no, I don't want that. <laughs> it's not, you know, what am I going to do with that? Keep it. <laughs> you need it more than I do. <laughs> so the point is that, you know, it's the soul that's loving. Why do we say heart? Because the, husk, the soul sits on the heart. Sometimes we find, where am I in the body? That's where you are. You're, in, you're right on the heart. Prabhupada said the heart is a seat. It's like a chair. You're just sitting on the heart. Therefore, emotions, love, come from that place within the body and express through the mind and the senses. But it's you that are loving, not this body. This body is simply a vehicle for your, for your inhabitants while you're in this material world. So this point is very important to understand because real love means to sacrifice. Srila Prabhupada sacrificed so much just to give us Krishna consciousness. He had everything. Prabhupada would be sitting in his room one day in, uh, in uh, I think it was Los Angeles. Prabhupada was sitting in his room in Los Angeles. It was a very nice apartment devotees had arranged. He was with few of his intimate devotees. And Prabhupada was talking. This was after he had somewhat developed his mission in the in U.S. And he said, do you remember what it was like when we were back at the Radha Dharmadar temple in Vrindavan? How nice it was. I was so happy there. I, I was so peaceful there. Oh, I long to go back t to Sri Vrindavan Dham. But then he said, but for me, that's sense gratification. What was Prabhupada saying? Because it's what I like. But what I, my mission is to give Krishna consciousness to others. So Prabhupada was expressing his heart. He didn't neglect his heart, but at the same time he understood that to give Krishna consciousness to others is the way to please Krishna and actually to feel to actually feel satisfied and happy within itself. So Prabhupada showed us in so many ways, and we'll get to see on this Saturday night the uh, the wonderful movie about the life of Srila Prabhupada. I've seen the movie three times, and I can't wait to see it again. How many of you have not seen the movie yet? Okay. How many of you are eager to see it again, although you did see it? Okay, that's that's good. It's it's like watching. It's like reading Bhagavatam because every time you read Bhagavatam, it's like the first time. And the life of Srila Prabhupada is living Bhagavatam. Is living Bhagavad Gita because he is living the actual philosophy we're trying to practice, which is coming from Krishna through Srimad Bhagavatam. So that was Prabhupada's uh, gift to the world, and he did it at great personal sacrifice. So sometimes they say love starts where sacrifice starts. And when it's easy, it may also look like love. But when it's hard to make another person happy or do something that will benefit another person at the expense of your own discomfort, that's the test. We're all faced with that test many times in our life. But that's, that's what makes life wonderful. And those who live in that way are the happiest persons. 
And so devotees are always like that. They always, always want to please others and serve others. But sometimes we find ourselves caught between what I like or what I think is best and what is actually, you know, the desire of Krishna and the desire of Srila Prabhupada. So Krishna will put us in these situations. Why? Just to increase our love for him. He does that. Sometimes people say, why is Krishna consciousness so hard? It's because we need to get tested just to bring out that love. The more a person who is determined to achieve Krishna consciousness, the tests are welcomed. Give me another test. Gives me a chance to surrender more. Gives me a chance to show my devotion more. And those who think, oh, why am I getting tested like this? Why is it so difficult? They're thinking, actually, you know, they blame a person. They blame the circumstances. They blame something outside of themselves. But it's actually the destiny of a de de devotee to somehow be put into situations where they have to surrender. But when you realize that, then you can welcome it. And the thing is, sometimes devotees used to ask Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, it, it's so difficult to surrender. I, sometimes I feel like I, you know, I just, just want to run away. I can't do it. Prabhupada said, don't think like that. Krishna will not test you beyond your ability to pass. I mean, he could do that. He could make it so impossible that you fall down. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He wants to make it a little bit beyond your, what we say, uh, comfort zone. We use that word, comfort zone. Get out of the comfort zone. Because death is not so comfortable. <laughs> and that, that throws you right out of your comfort zone. So when we are being prepared for these, we're preparing ourselves to leave this world by being thrown out of our little comfort zone by situations that Krishna presents to us. And I'm happy because I know some of you here had a real difficult situation where you had to choose between your plans and coming here. And I see, I won't mention any names, some of the devotees who came here and pushed their plans aside or made adjustments in their plans. But there, was a many, there were many devotees who had that same situation and took the other route. When you choose Krishna, you never lose. And Krishna shows you that as soon as you, chose, you take shelter of Krishna. Because they say, if you lose your money, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. Because health is important. We need health. And if you, but if you lose Krishna, what's left? Everything else. But what are you going to do with it? <laughs> it's not important. And so our relationship with the Lord is the foundation of our happiness in our success in life. So Krishna will test us. So here we have the ultimate in tests. And what is that test? Two brothers so dear to each other that they can only think of the happiness of the other. That's all. That's all. And Ram, he is so fixed on duty. He has such as, this is my father. My father is no longer here. He has asked me to come to the forest. When you weigh the circumstances, none of it makes sense. It was all a plot by an envious person. At least it seemed like that. So he could have said, oh, this Montara, she's just, you know, she's in Maya. He didn't say that. He said, actually, this is his father's request. And he accepted it. The Ramayan is full of values obligations. Sometimes we find ourselves in that situation where 
we have to sacrifice either our character or we have to sacrifice something we like. But character is the person. What we like and what we don't like comes and goes. Our character is actually our substance. And for a devotee, devotee knows that the character I develop in relationship to everyone is my, is my success in practicing Krishna consciousness. What is that character? One develops those qualities which are conducive to receiving the mercy of Krishna, the sweet mercy of Krishna. And so this loving relationship between these two brothers is so deep and so full of selflessness that the other is arguing and trying to think of different ways to convince the other person to accept prosperity. And uh, the other person's thinking, I want that other person. And the other per the person who's thinking, I'm willing to do anything just to allow that other person to have it. Bard said, I'll come to the forest. I'll stay here. I'll take up to 14 years. Ram said, no, that's my, that's my happiness. You can't do that. <laughs> he didn't say it like that. But that's what he was saying. This is my destiny. This is what I, I am. I will do that. You rule the kingdom. So th this is a wonderful pastime within there. It's, it's, a, it's called a tug of love. <laughs> tug of love. Okay, so any questions, comments? Yes, Leela. My question, I have two. One is uh, from this, how can we uh, put in practice the internal changes, the external it's quite easy, put a tilak on, wear certain clothing, be in a certain mood externally. But how can we churn internal that we really change from within? Mm. Um, that is one question. And another question is... Can uh, I take one at a time? Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me. I probably forget one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the uh, fifth canto of Bhagavatam, you find Maharaj uh, Parikshit. After hearing from Sukadev Goswami about the hellish planets and how the living entity has to suffer in these various hells, he's overwhelmed with grief and remorse, and he's thinking how much they have to suffer. So now he's thinking, how can they be relieved? Is there some type of atonement? He calls it prasthitya, or atonement. What is that atonement they can be free from this? Uh, and basically, what uh, Sukadeva Goswami basically answers is that, that just doing good works or good deeds doesn't change the heart. It doesn't change the heart. He says you can't, you know, purify a wine-stained cloth with wine. His point was that I want to be, you know, I've, I have these qualities and therefore I should just act the opposite way. But it says, and this is interesting, this is in the Shrutis, the, the actual Vedas, it says that if you want love of God, it takes 10,000 efforts to get it. If you want to, if you're not austere, and you want to become austere, it takes a thousand efforts to get it, a thousand. So in our initial attempt to somehow overcome or to do something opposite than the negativity, the external point is important, but unless the heart changes, 
we'll start to revert back to our old ways again. So one of the ways to develop that internal is association. By associating with people who have those qualities, we gradually start developing the qualities that, we, that those persons have. So we look to that association. Again, we mentioned how association is the foundation for everything we want to be and want to accomplish in our Krishna consciousness. So, and of course, along with that, it's chanting the holy names of the Lord. Chaitil Dharpana Marjanam. And that the heart becomes pure and the mind becomes cleansed through the process of Harinam. But, if unless we take association from devotees along with chanting the holy name, quality association, it'll be a very slow, and sometimes we even fall from that process. So both these two things are actually foundational for developing that internal mood, association and chanting the holy names of the Lord. And then, of course, acting in the way that you want to be also. Sometimes people think, oh, I don't feel like that. Why should I act like that? But if it's, but if it's in connection with Krishna and devotional service, feelings doesn't really matter so much. Because how we feel changes from time to time, but what we are doesn't change. The soul is by nature pure, the soul is by nature good. So everyone, is, everyone by nature has all good qualities. That's our nature. Our nature is love. Everyone is simply an element of love for Krishna and for others. That's our nature. So when we act according to our nature, we start to reveal that nature. And if we act according to how we feel, then we might, we just, we're just emphasizing that feeling. It may have nothing to do with what is beneficial or not beneficial. So therefore, feelings come and go, but acting on intelligence or acting out of, of understanding what is beneficial. So it takes some introspection to do that. When we don't become introspective in the way and how things happen to us, we become impetuous and then react instead of thinking. So it says a, a person who is actually determined to change reflects upon re before reacting, thinks before saying things. Because then they know once it's said and once it's done, it's too late. So act properly and also purify the heart through association and chanting the holy names. It's a gradual process. Hmm. Okay, you had another question. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Does it make sense to everybody? <laughs> yes, no, this is for purely for me, but I thought I'll ask everybody else as well. My second question is, Guru Maharaj, that um, the relationships in this day and age, um, I mean, we all see over and over again, time and time again, that uh, the relationships don't seem to have a depth. It, on the surface, the relationships are pretty sweet. But on a deeper level, there are still that envy, envy, uh, who is higher than who. Competition. Competition. So it happens everywhere, within, outside, and within, inside, as well. So how do we overcome that? How, Com how competition can is not bad. Competition is actually good when it's done in the right mood. <laughs> it's the mood that makes it right or not right. If you're competing with somebody to do better, that's good, but if you're doing it just to drag the other person down or to prove yourself better than the person, then that element sort of is, 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 has the element of envy and what we say, uh, 
and false pride. Both of these two things are there. But competition is good. Prabhupada says in the spiritual world, the gopis compete with each other to see who can serve Krishna best. So one gopi says, oh, look at that other gopi. She's serving so nicely. I want to serve just as nice, and I'm going to even serve better than her. So what happens? Who benefits? Krishna. <laughs> Krishna benefits because the competition is all directed to trying to improve their service to Krishna. So if you want to compete in this world, whatever benefits you get from that competition, use it to serve others, that's all. But don't do it in a mean-spirited way. Even if you lose, you think, oh. Just like, if, how many of you dro drive in India? I'm sure you, most of you don't. <laughs> In India, it's not like in the West. In, in India, when somebody beats you in driving, it's like, hey, he's better than me. It's good. You know, it's like, you know, they're competing to see who can cut each other off better, you know? <laughs> it's getting like the West now, it's changing. But in the West, they, you know, they, they use different, you know, mantras when that happens, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to repeat some of those mantras. <laughs> but, I mean, India is not the ideal example. That's just kind of thing, because that's the way it used to be, that, you know, who's better at driving? Let me see if I can get ahead of him, you know? <laughs> so. But in the spiritual context, and this is what we should be talking about, in the spiritual context is that competition is good, but if you lose, if you go to the other person and say, Hey, that was great, you did it. It's not like it's you, you want to tear the other person down or you feel unhappy because you became second or whatever number you had became. The competition is good. But it's not about me, it's about using that spirit to serve others with that competitive nature. That's so this is about. Let me give the best class. Let me give the nicest kirtan. Why? For the benefit of others. For benefit of Krishna, that's why. That's all right. But keep that, that mean-spiritedness makes everything material. It just drags the whole thing down. And you can tell. If you lose and you're happy, that's spiritual. <laughs> if you lose and you're not happy, that's material. <laughs> Prabhupada said, the difference between material and spiritual is one thing, enviousness. He said, if you're not envious, you're on the spiritual platform. If you're envious, you're on the material platform. So competition sometimes is inspired by envy. But there is spiritual envy, which inspires greater service. Is that all right? Um, yes, okay. <laughs> There's a little element of hesitation in that. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, but how do we solidify our relationships within, within the God brothers, God sisters, within the devotee community, within our, our, our devotee family? How do, we, how do we come out of this? How, how do we turn this envy, negative envy or negative competition into positive? And how do, we, how do we make the relationship that is a real relationship rather than false relationship? Between each other or between you and Krishna? No, both? between among the devotees. By serving the other devotees. And serving the other devotees is not <coughs> something you do because it just happens to appear. Oh, okay, I get a chance to serve the devotees. No, you have to actively look for opportunities to serve the devotees. Devotion and Vaishnav Seva means you should be thinking, how can I serve the devotees? And that will keep you in that mood. Because when you serve the devotees and the devotees are benefited, you become happy. And Krishna's pleased like that. We, we, we accept service to give service. We have to accept service also from others. And that service is simply an opportunity for us to use what we gain so we can again turn it around and use it to serve more and more. 
we need things and sometimes we other persons help us get those things and sometimes we want things but up to a certain point we should think oh all right i'm other devotees are serving me and i'll take i'm happy about their service and but i turn it around and just use use the benefits i come from that service to serve them that's all Prabhupada is a competition between the devotee and Krishna who can serve the best and Krishna always wins. <laughs> they had a competition between Ram and Bart to see who could who could serve the other person and Ram won. <laughs> yeah, like that. Okay, thank you very much. That makes more sense now. Thank you. Okay, we try to be sensible. <laughs> <laughs> Sri Devi, can you come up a little? Closer to the mic. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. This class was just riveting. Every word was wonderful. Um, but I didn't quite catch four things that you, Your Holiness mentioned. Peace is destroyed by personal desires. Mm -hmm. And I got the last one, wise company is destroyed by wrong association. But the middle two, I couldn't catch. Um, intros, mm, mm, let's see, where is it? Introspection is destroyed by ignorance. And satisfaction is destroyed by hankering. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Okay, is that good? I saw there was a question on this. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Gunta. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got a little problem understanding the ethics between um, Ram and his father. Uh, like, I said clearly how is Ram honoring his father when he is honoring his word over his real wish? Hmm. Well, his wish was to please his father. <laughs> his father said, become the king. He said, fine. His father said, go to the forest. He said, fine. So whatever his father asked him to do, he considered that to be his duty towards his father. It wasn't like he was e greedy to become a king. He was just the most qualified and also the oldest of all the brothers. and Therefore, he was the rightful heir to the throne. And he also proved to be the, the most illustrious among those who were qualified. But then when his father said, do something else, he didn't even consider, you know, his previous, you know, request. There's a whole series in the, in the Ramayan where there's a dialogue between his father and him. And, you know, everyone's trying to convince him not to go. Even his father, although he did it because he had to keep his word, and the Kshatriya's word is more than, more important than anything. If Ram would have said, you know, what you say is nice, but the citizens are not going to be pleased, and didn't honor it, Dasarat wouldn't have protested. It broke his heart to say what he had to say. He didn't want to say it, but he was duty bound because he gave his word. So in the same way, he felt, Ram felt that his father is his spiritual master and therefore his spiritual master is asking him to leave. And therefore there wasn't the slightest bit of hesitation on the part of this. And he said, if this is what you want, father, uh, I'm, I'm practically gone. <laughs> well, what... What Dasarat didn't see is that Lakshman also went and Sita went too. <laughs> they actually all went because no one could be separated from Ram without losing their 
life, that was how much Ram was dear to him, even the citizens. The citizens wanted to all live in the forest. They wanted to all leave Ayodhya and go to the forest and stay with Ram in the forest. They said, let Bart rule the kingdom. There will be nobody there. He can have it. <laughs> That's what they were saying, yeah. And But uh, Ram said, no, you go back. You go back. This is Father's word. Please, we'll, we must honor him. He's no longer with us. Yeah. So that was his... Uh, dedication to his father. And in Vedic culture, it's understood that the parents are the first guru, which leads us to the second guru, which is our eternal spiritual master. So in the, in the scriptures, it says that uh, to honor superiors, and the superiors are listed, one is father and mother. But nowadays, if father and mother are not living according to religious or even moral principles, it becomes a question. And then where, where do we stand? Do we follow that or we don't follow it? And that really depends on the situation. In some cases, we actually follow it even though it's wrong. In some other cases, we don't. It depends on the situation. So honoring superiors is the foundation for uh, honoring the Lord because we see in the world people don't want to follow others. They want to follow whatever they think is best. The world is like that. It's just a product of this age. Everyone's their own authority. Okay? that help? I understand the value of um, honoring and following superiors, yes. Uh, still, in this case, it was uh, Dasharata's wish was that uh, Ram would be king, if I get it right. But then he changed after... Still he, to honor his promise that he gave to his wife, he changed because he was forced to. Okay, he was forced to change. Then it's clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Roberto, you had a question? Thank you very much, Haraj. Uh, I, I, I couldn't coop, uh, keep up with all the thing, uh, <laughs> points that you were saying, so it was hard to write them down all. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I have. Uh, can you explain me one one situation when um, you said uh, value relationship over position, power, wealth, or something? So can you ca tell me one one um, one example where uh, we shouldn't value relationship over something else? Well, it's a principle of life. What is the most important thing in life is, re is love. Everyone wants love and everyone wants to be loved. In order to, gi to get love, you have to give love. If you don't give love, you don't get love. <coughs> Sometimes people say, nobody loves me. Well, try loving somebody and see what happens. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Unless you're God, then it's easy. <laughs> You don't have to worry about it because they love you automatically. But <laughs> So, yeah, the point is that uh, we'll be tested between, you know, relationships or possessions. That was basically the distinction. Material things are personal relationships. Basically, what's more important? In some cases, it might be even the material thing, but that's generally not the principle. The principle is that relationships are the foundations of happiness. So, in some places, some situations, relationships will naturally break just due to circumstances. And you see that throughout the Ramayana, like that. 
But it's the circumstances that dictate it. It's not so much a person's desire that does it. It's circumstance. Just like uh, there's one pastime, and it's not an exactly a pastime, but uh, Prabhupada was in the temple and he was there and one important guest came. So Prabhupada turned to one brahmachari who was there and he said, uh, please go get some maha prasadam for our guest. So the boy left and went into the pujari room and the pujari had just put the offering on the altar so there was nothing available. So uh, the boy comes back and the pujari tells him you have to wait for the offering. He goes back to Prabhupada and tells him the situation. Prabhupada said, no, go get it. Bring it now. Prabhupada didn't want the guest to wait. He didn't want the guest to wait. So uh, he went back, and this time the pujari was doing his Gayatri. So he walked right past the pujari and went on the altar and got the deity's plate, <laughs> walked off. <laughs> that was a fast Gayatri by the pujari. <laughs> And then, you know, there was a chase. The Vajari is chasing the devotee, running with the prasadam, running to Prabhupada. So they both arrived at Prabhupada at the same time. <laughs> so who's right and who's wrong? Is the Pujari wrong? No. Is the devotee wrong? No. Circumstance. <laughs> so sometimes you find circumstances dictate situations where you find yourself at odds with a person and it's just the circumstances that cause it. It's not that you really want it or even desire it or even play into it, but it's just the circumstance. So when that happens, what can you do? You can just somehow or other apologize and just, you know, say it was misunderstanding or whatever reason. Uh, Radhavi Nodini? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, while uh, you answered uh, Lila Shakti Mataji's questions, uh, qu uh, first question, uh, you mentioned that uh, feelings are not uh, important. And I was wondering, uh, what I, uh, while uh, doing any activity, what is the difference between feelings and consciousness? Feelings and consciousness? Consciousness yes. is you. Feelings are things that come and go. They're your desires. They're emotions. <coughs> imagine a sky, and then you imagine different things within the sky. The sky is your consciousness. The different things you see in the sky are the different feelings that move throughout the sky. So feelings come and feelings go. So consciousness is, is the, the nature of the soul's na actual existence. It's not the mind. It's, it's pure awareness, which is, p which, which is called pristine consciousness or clear consciousness, Krishna consciousness. But feelings, they, they're part of the emotional body which are governed by our desires. So we can check emotions or we can express emotions, feelings. But consciousness is constant. Consciousness is life. It's you. <laughs> Does that help? Uh, what yes. you write on consciousness is, is what you is your material makeup, that's all. I understand it uh, theoretically, but uh, I just don't know in practice uh, what is it means. How can I make a difference between them? Or uh, the thing is, you have to observe your feelings instead of being dragged by your feelings. If you if you can control your feelings and senses and mind and emotions and desires, then then you can go and direct your life. Uh, but if you're pulled by them, and they, they pull you in this way or that way, then they're, they're actually, you're under their control. So that's why we find to have good association helps us to control our mind and senses. 
when we're alone, a lot of times we're subjected to our own desires and thoughts. But if we can control that through introspection, and through intelligence, and intellectual introspective, and then you can use your emotions in the best possible way and check those emotions which are detrimental by observing your emotions. Learn how to observe them. But sometimes the emotions are so strong. The, the more negative the emotion, the quicker it comes and goes. Anger co comes and goes quick. Happiness stays longer. <laughs> so, yeah, otherwise we're controlled by these things. And that could get us in trouble. Thank you very much. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see. Sri Devi, you have another question. Okay. Thank how you. Are we, how are we doing on time? Nine. We should end at 9.15, because that's the uh, cutoff. Okay. Um, thank you for your patience with me, Guru Maharaj. My question is, uh, during the course of the lecture, Your Holiness said that real love means sacrifice. When we sacrifice for the other person. But um, uh, my question is, where do we draw that line? Because sometimes, you know, like a child can go on demanding money even if they're grown up, you know. They never grow up. They just keep on asking you, and then you sacrifice, you love them so much, you try to help them, but it never seems to end. Well, doesn't, sacrifice doesn't mean agreeing with them. <laughs> if you're in a position to make sure that they do the right thing, then your sacrifice is their welfare and not so much what you do or say. That's the sacrifice. You make their welfare your, your business, and then you use your intelligence to use to do that. So sometimes you have to tell them things that they don't like because it's good for them. But they don't like that. <laughs> they don't mind that? They don't like that. They don't like being told to grow up and manage their finances and become independent and so on. Well, if you give them something they like, it cost, could cause them to, to uh, you know, to do things which hurt others or hurt themselves. That's Therefore, true. in the position of a parent or a guru or a teacher, you're supposed to be able to give that guidance. And whether they like it or not, it's good for them. Prabhupada tells the story of a one lady who her, her sister died and her son was left all alone. There was no father there. So she took the boy. And therefore, the boy was young, and she didn't want to discipline him, so she let him do whatever he wanted to do. And then he started doing the wrong things, but she felt, you know, I love him, I don't want to tell him what to do. And finally, he started, you know, committing crimes, and finally he killed somebody. And then he went to jail. Well, he went to court. And in the court, Prabhupada describes his story how the judge sentenced the boy to death. And the auntie was in the courtroom listening to it, and now she's crying. Before he's taken away, the boy said to the judge, can I speak to my auntie before you take me away? The judge granted that. So he went, and he got close to his auntie, and then he got really close, like he was going to speak something, and he, got, he, he bit her in the ear really hard. And then she jumped back. He said, now you're crying. It's too late. If you would have told me what was right, this would have never happened. Mm -hmm. So later on, he, he understood that her permissiveness was just his downfall, because she was responsible to take care of him, and she didn't. Mm. That's an extreme example. But it's, it's indicative that sometimes you have to tell people, you, you know, 
something, but you, if you can do it in such a way that they can receive it. This is also the art of being in a position of authority. You have to see how best that person can receive what they, what they don't want to receive. And sometimes it just doesn't work, no matter how you say it. But you should let them know that you're doing it because you care for them and not because they're bothering you and therefore what they're doing is just bothering you and therefore they should not do it. If you get bothered, that's wrong. But if you're concerned about their welfare and you have to say something, that's the motivation. Thank you. Does that make sense? Eminently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How Thank many times you. have I told you things you didn't like, right? <laughs> many, many okay. times. Okay, you're still here. Howdy uh, well. Thank you for doing <laughs> that for me. That's why I'm still Hare here. Krishna. Thank you. <laughs> I get told things I don't like too. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, so we'll break it, take a break for lunch. Sri Ramayan Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo.